Hey, Celine, how are you? Oh, hey, Martin. Hey, hello, how are you? Good, good, good. Oh, you have a lot of books. Uh, that's my landlord's. Uh, you have a nice uh, bridge. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so what's the local time now? In, yeah, yeah, in yeah, yeah, it's 10 a.m. It's very nice. Oh, okay. So, yeah, nice to see you. Okay, so uh, it's five o'clock, and uh, today uh, we have Shiling Yu from Xiamen University uh, in Fujian, China, to talk about deformation quantization of joint orbits. Let's welcome. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so today, so my I will talk about um, representation theory of uh, reductive Lie groups. But it has some like a lot of uh, flavor of non commutative geometry in it. So, so first of all, so my talk is based on my um, joint work with uh, uh, Kono Leung. And also, part of it, uh, the last part of it is based on uh, ongoing joint work with Ivan Osef. Okay, so here's the outline of my, my talk. So in the first part, I will give some uh, basic introduction to representation theory of reductive Lie groups in case you, you are not familiar with it. And in the second part, I will talk about the geometric way to construct representations, which is uh, uh, the so-called core joint orbit method philosophy. And third part is about our work on uh, um, orbit method using deformation quantization. Okay, so, um, so throughout this, uh, talk. So I will take G sub R to denote some real semi-simple Lie group or maybe reductive Lie group. And so, so it's always non-compact. Um, and we fix a uh, maximum compact subgroup, K sub R instead of G sub R. So for instance, if I have uh, SO2R, so which is uh, like the simplest non-compact reductive Lie group, uh, then we can take SO2, for example, as uh, the maximum compact subgroup. I mean, the choice is not unique, but it's unique up to con conjugation, right? So, I mean, the key, uh, the key central problem in representation theory is to classify all irreducible unitary representation of uh, such a group. And it's like the hardest uh, case when the group is non-compact. So when the group is compact, so we know there's this highest weight theory, which allow us to classify all the uh, irreducible unitary representation. And then in this case, every, every such representation is finite dimensional. But in the non compact case, really, so you, you have to do with like infinite dimensional representation on, on Hilbert space, okay? And also we take, so, in the, so when we drop the subscript R, so this means that we take the complexification of the groups and also the Lie algebra. So uh, for little g sub r, little k sub r, so they are used to denote the um, Lie algebra of uh, the group g r and k r. And if we drop the subscript, so that means uh, we we take the complexification. Okay? And uh, for such Lie algebras, so we have the uh, Cardan involution, which allows us to decompose them into um, Two parts. So one is this uh, Lie subalgebra, K sub R, 
And the other part is the orthogonal complement uh, with respect to the kernel form. So this piece of bar is no longer least of algebra, but it still carries a representation of the group K sub bar. And also we have a complexified version. Okay. So, I mean, the, the classification problem is uh, still open. Like we know the case of GLNR and SLNR, but like for other groups, like even classical groups, so still this, uh, it's widely open. Um, and then Harshandra has uh, the following like um, uh, key observation. So given any such irreducible unitary representation of G sub R, so pi is the uh, representation is the action and V sub pi is the underlying Hilbert space. So then you can always find a dense subspace. There's a V which I denote by V pi infinity. Okay. Um, inside it, which is a purely algebraic object, Okay, so we forget about the topology. So then we, but we still have the uh, action of the maximum compact K sub R. And then you can complexify it to get, get the action of K, but, but the group G sub R no longer acts on such space. So it doesn't preserve the vectors uh, in V infinity. But he showed that if we take the uh, differential of the G R action, so then we get the action of the Lie algebra little g. So this still, this action still preserves the V infinity. So in other words, we get like a new um, algebraic uh, object coming from um, the unitary representation. That's a pair of the little g action and capital K action. And they should be compatible in a natural way. I mean, for such an object, we call them a Hartrander module or GK module, okay? And Harshandra showed that conversely, so if you have uh, such a structure, such a uh, GK mo module, um, and also with some uh, invariant unitary structure, you can actually recover the original un unitary representation, the GR representation. So in other words, so basically it's essential to study this geometric object in order to classify all unitary representation. Okay? So, but I mean, for Hartrander module, so you don't, it doesn't ha have to take, uh, carry a uh, unitary structure. Okay, so you can classify all possible irreducible Hartrander module. So this question is relatively easier. Okay, and we have like several different, like scheme to, to, to describe the, uh, uh, this set. But then the difficult thing is to determine like among all these irreducible Hartrander models, so which part has which part are actually unitary representations. Okay. So I mean, so in today's talk, so I would just focus on like the algebraic side. I would just talk about how random module without talking about the um, analytical aspect. Okay. So uh, in case you never see um, representation of non-compact uh, Lie groups, so here's a like simple example. So we take SU2R, okay. But what, um, just for simplicity of notation, so I want to think of it as the group SU11. Okay, so this is the uh, special unitary group, but uh, which uh, does not um, preserve the usual like Euclidean inner product, but instead it preserves this one. So one negative one. Okay, so you can write down, um, so you can find that so this consists of all two by two complex measures of this form. So then in this case, so we can take K to be the, uh, the maximum combat to be the diagonal matrices like this. Okay, so this K lives inside the complexification SO2R, uh, sorry, SO2C. So this is the complexification of SO2R. So then for the Lie algebra of SO2C, so we know that, so this is three dimensional and there's some like elementary like a basis consisting of three uh, elements, E, F and H where H is diagonal and the H is actually living inside K. So such that they satisfy the following um, commutation rule like this, okay. So now, so in this picture, in the picture below, so I just illustrate a particular high-trend module, okay, using diagrams. 
So now we think about the higher trend module as just as K representation. So usually it's reducible. So you decomposing into like many irreducible K representations, okay, finite dimensional um, with multiplicities. Okay? Now in this case, because K is just a torus, right? So it's a one dimension torus group. So then it's, so, so all the irreducible rotation are just classified by, by, by integer. So I have a, all these integer labels, like minus two, zero, four. And here you can see that only even numbers appear in, in this module. So the reason is that, so if I take, so, so you can look at these two equations. Uh, sorry, these two equations. So this means that the operator E and F, so they will just uh, increase the eigenvalue of H by two or decrease by two. Okay, so, so that's why that we only get like even numbers here. So you can also find like um modules with only um, odd uh, H eigenvalues, okay? And these, the, the right arrows here, so denote, denote E and the left one correspond to F. Okay, so this is the particular example of higher trend module. Okay, and for SO2R, so we have the classification of all the unit representation. You can see that already it's much more complicated than the compact group SU2. Um, for instance, we have we have discrete series representations, okay? So like these two families. So they behave like similarly to um, uh, the representation theory of compact groups. So where like, the representation are just uh, labeled by natural numbers or integers. So here this L, the label for uh, the discrete series representation. And the rightmost columns so correspond to K types, they're just the uh, decomposition into K representations. You can see that, so here, for example, for holomorphic discrete series, so we get, so the K types start from like L plus one, then, then every time you add by two and it goes to infinity. And for the anti-holomorphic discrete series, it goes to negative infinity in the other direction, okay? But, and then also we have these two limits, so-called limit of discrete series representation, the where you just let L to be equal to zero, okay? And they, they just like behave similar to discrete series. Um, but then we also have the two continuous families of representation, they're called principal series representation. And here you can see that the, the parameter L are now like imaginary uh, numbers. And the K types um, in these, each of these two families just stay the same. So you have, for example, um, in the even case, just all the even uh, K types going in both directions. And in the order principles, there you have all, just all the K types, okay? Um, now then there's also this complementary series representation, okay? Um, as higher trend module, so it behaves similar to, as uh, similarly as principal series representation, you have K types, which is all the even numbers. So now the O is just some real number between zero and one. And I want to mention that um, for the uh, for all the representations are then complementary series here. So those are really called tempered representation. So those appear in the decomposition of uh, two functions of G and it can be captured by the reduced C star algebra. Okay. And um, while the, uh, the last one, so this guy is non-tempered. Okay, so it's much more mysterious than the, uh, than the, uh, the, uh, the temper representation, okay? Okay, so, so it's complicated story. So we want to have a nice geometric picture to, to like describe this, um, these complicated representations. So, okay, so here is another um, picture. So where I just put all the representation on the complex plane. So we're all like each point in the complex plane just correspond to this, this uh, parameter L. Okay. And you can see that also in, in the background, in the, the yellow part, so these are non-unitary uh, high-channel modules. So they don't have a unitary structures. 
So only these like four families have a unitary structure. Okay, so are there any questions for this basic example? No, okay. So now let me talk about this uh, uh, core John orbit method. So, so it's so probably it starts like um, from like 1960s, around 1960s. So Kirov and Constant, uh, they have the idea that uh, somehow you can get all the irreducible unitary representation of the Lie group. So here now G is just general Lie groups. So it doesn't have to be reductive. So you can get them by quantizing uh, the core joint orbits in G star. So here, core joint orbits just means that, so I have this core joint action on G, uh, of G on the due of this Lie algebra, right? But so they do a, decompose this like alpha space into like infinite many orbits, okay? And each of them is called core joint orbit. So they observe that, so each of these orbits um, uh, is naturally a uh, symplectic manifold with some G invariant symplectic form, right? So like in, in classical mechanics, uh, so, so, so you want to think of such like symplectic manifold as uh, like the phase space of the physical, classical physical system. And they say that, so uh, by the philosophy of quantization, so you can look at how classical mechanical system pass to the uh, quantized system. And in this way, you, you can get like the unitary representation of G. So they should correspond to the quantum physics, okay? I mean, the, like in the early like stage of uh, open method, so they they use geometric quantization to 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 quantize orbits. So let let me um, roughly reveal so what geometric quantization is. So first of all, we need a uh, nice line bundle L, so which is G equivalent called pre quantum line bundle, such that its first chain class um, is given by this simplicity form. Okay. But note that so this already put a lot of uh, restriction on the orbit you can you can take. Okay, so not every orbit uh, satisfy this condition. Uh, but then second, so we need some G invariant polarization on this manifold. So I'm not going to explain this uh, notion. But so one like most popular one of the most popular example is when you have a complex structure. I, or maybe just a Kähler structure, such that the, uh, it's compatible with the simplicity form. Okay? So then you can then you can show that this L, pre quantum L, so also will carry the holomorphic structure. So then we can look at all holomorphic sections on O, and maybe with some other restrictions. So you take certain nice space of holomo L2 holomorphic sections uh, of L, on O, so this gives us a Hilbert space, and it carries naturally carries a uh, G action because every structure is G invariant here. Okay, so then we get a G representation. Okay, and then we want to think of this edge at the uh, the quantization of O. So basic example when you take compact group, for example SU two. So in this case, it's uh, the Lie algebra is three dimensional. Okay, so it's it's the same as the Euclidean space, and the G action is just by by the Euclidean motion and rotation, and so all the orbits are just just spheres. And the orbit, so on the sphere, you can put this uh, some natural holomorphic structure, so that it's it becomes CP one. Okay, so and L, you can just take it to be. A, all the positive line bundles on the CP1, depending on like, so you have like a family of spheres which satisfy this integrability condition, right? So they are all isomorphic to the CP1, but depending on what simplicity form you have, okay? So you'll have a different, different L, okay? So, uh, so this run over all positive line bundles, then you just take a holomorphic section of this L. 
So you get all the irreducible finite dimensional representation of SU2. And it's basically a reformulation of Borel way. Because in this case, CP1 is just the, uh, the flag variety uh, of G. Okay, so, so orbit method has success in this case, in, in, in compact group case. And also in uh, the case of new potent group and some solvable groups, um, they also show that, so like people like Kirillov and Colston, uh, they show that the, the orbit philosophy works nicely. And sometimes you, you don't take uh, complex polarization, you, you can take a real polarization instead, in like for example, in the new potent group case. Okay, so, so the geometric quantization works pretty well in all these cases. Right, but now the difficult part is when we pass to a non compact reductive league group, for example, this SU11. Okay, so in this case, we, we can write down the write down the Lie algebra, so it consists of two by two matrices of this form, okay, and try to analyze all the core joint orbits. So you can write down explicitly the equations satisfied by those orbits. Uh, because I mean, somehow you see that this A, this as a two by two matrix, so its determinant is always invariant under the conjugation. So in fact, the equation of those orbits just look like this. So you just fix the determinant of A, and but the determinant of A is given by this quadratic uh, expression x squared minus um, the norm of B squared, and you fix it to be a some some uh, some 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 number some 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 real number and here you see that I use L here L square over four four so you will see later that it matches with this parameter L in my table of uh, unitary representation showed you before okay so so there are three cases basically here so when L square is greater than zero you know. In other words, L is a real number. So we have the so-called elliptic orbits. So this is the type A case. So in fact, you see that uh, one equation in this case will give you two disjoint orbits. And they are all isomorphic to the Pongari disk. So you can give them a G invariant, nice G invariant complex structure. You quantize them using geometric quantization. And we recut recover the discrete series of representation. Now in the third case, type C case, we have L squared less than zero. So that's even when L is the imaginary number. So in this case, we, we can have like a real polarization uh, on those orbits. So they are just root surfaces. So you have, you can like, so you have like family of lines cover the entire orbit. And they are actually uh, um, a real polarization. So namely it's a uh, foliation by Lagrangian submanifolds. And you take geometric quantization in this case, then we re recover the principal series representation. Okay. But the difficult part is when L squared equal to zero. So in this case, we get a comb in the middle. And you see this comb consists of three different orbits. So the upper comb, the lower comb, and the origin in the middle, right? So another problem is how do you quantize this kind of orbits? So those are called the new potent orbits because uh, each point in such orbit just correspond to a, a new potent matrix A, okay? So if, let's go back to the table before Okay, we can see that we, um, so there are still like two limit of discrete series representation, which we didn't use. So you can argue that, so we assign the limit of discrete series representation to the two half combs, okay? So that's one like remedy, okay? Because here, so we don't have nice, uh, nice polarization. So we don't know how to apply geometric quantization. But then the issue is that we also have 
the family of principal series representation, right? So when L is not equal to zero, so the obvious look like this, but then you can just imagine that we have a family of principal series representation when L goes to zero and the whole, this family of orbits, the so finally converges to this uh, singular comb. And so the entire comb somehow should correspond to a like an even principal series representation with L equal to zero. So already you see that here, you cannot get a bijection between like geometric ob object like orbits with line bundle um, and hope that it correspond to like in a bijective way correspond to all the unitary irreducible unitary representation. Okay, so already like, so somehow you see that this comb can be used like twice, okay? Okay, so that's one, one big issue, okay? Um, so then we have to adjust the original orbit conjecture a little bit, okay? So have to like sit back and maybe uh, ask for something, something less, okay? Okay, so, so for the, um, so, so you see that the main issue with new proton orbit is that we don't have a nice geometry structure on those orbits, okay? But on the other hand, there's a kind of mysterious correspondence um, lying behind the, uh, in, in the back, background. So this is so-called Kosen sakiguchi verkhonen correspondence, okay? So they find that, so if, so if we look at the set of all new proton GR orbit, okay? So, so these are symplectic, real symplectic manifold, which are denoted by O sub R together with the real symplectic form omega sub R, okay? So it turns out that if we consider another set, so which consists of all the new potent K orbits in P star. So recall that so this K is the complexification of my maximal compact subgroup. And P star is also, I mean, the complexification. So everything is uh, complex. Okay, so then those orbits, so the, they are naturally just algebraic uh, varieties, or you, you, you can think of them as complex manifold. So they carry, uh, they carry a complex structure, okay? So it turns out there's a bijection between them. Bijection between them, but actually moreover, so Verkhonen shows that, that they are in fact uh, diffeomorphic as manifold. A smooth manifold, and moreover, so if so, if you identify them as one manifold, then the complex structure I and the symplectic structure omega together give give us a Kähler structure. So it, this is quite beautiful. So I mean, he, so she she used some like hyper Kähler geometry and some work of Kronheimer and other people, like uh, in terms of like using like Nam's equation to show such such different morphin exist, okay? But then you want to say, okay, so maybe, so now we have a holomorphic structure, so we can again apply geometric quantization, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't work because here, so the simplicity structure is GI invariant, right? But the complex structure is not, it's only King invariant. So the reason is that um, I mean, it should not be surprising because at the beginning, when we fix this K, as I said before, so um, you have choices. It's not, it's not unique, okay? So once you fix the choice of K, it's, it's like you break the symmetry. So you no, no longer have the GR symmetry. So the complex structure can only be K invariant, not GI invariant. But for, um, in order to apply geometric quantization, so we need to uh, we need a, a G G invariant complex structure. So this is not good. Okay, so here the example of such uh, this uh, KSV correspondence and explicit diffeomorphism. So, uh, but since time is limited, let me skip this. Okay. Okay, but then this makes you think. Okay, so maybe you know, somehow this still this extra like information of uh, like K in very complex structure uh, can help us in, in orbit method. So here's a fake commutative diagram. So 
on the left column, so we have the usual orbit uh, method conjecture, the geometric quantization, um, such that we can quantize GR orbit to get GR representations. Okay? On the right column, we have K orbit in P star. <coughs> and here at the right bottom, so I have GK modules. So we know that for um, Harishchandra showed us that basically uh, to consider GR representation is the same as uh, considering GK modules. Okay, so there's a correspondence between them. And on the top, so we have this KSV correspondence, okay, which passes from GR orbit to K orbit. So the question is maybe we can try to build a bridge between this geometric object um, and this GK modules. So if we can realize this guy in question mark, so then we can think of it as a um, kind of a replacement of the, uh, the original orbit method, okay? And so, but why this K orbits will show up in, 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 representation, in representation theory? So this is, this is related to so-called associate variety construction. Um, so given a high chandler module M, okay, so we can always take some K invariant good filtration, okay, which I will define below. So this is a filtration of vector subspaces, okay, finite dimensional and K invariant the family, you know, by F sub I M. And M is just a union of all these uh, finite dimensional subspaces. But the N itself can be infinite dimensional. And moreover, so uh, recall that um, UG, so this is the M, universal enveloping algebra. of the D algebra. Okay, so it's still with the associative non commutative algebra. Uh, but on that, on it, we have some nice filtration, FIUG. So basically, this is just, I mean, recall that every element in UG is just a product of several elements in, in the Lie algebra G. So now if I write, write out, write every element as a product. So there should, so those elements in Fi of UG are those elements which have a such expression such that, so this K, the total number of element decomposition here is less or equal than I, okay? So this also give us a nice filtration of this UG. Okay, so then our, we require that the filtration on M, our M is compatible with the filtration of UG in the following sense. So F sub I UG times F sub J of M okay, uh, should lie in F sub I plus J of M. Okay. And moreover, if we consider um, the associate graded module of M, so this will be a module over the associate graded algebra of UG with respect to this filtration. But what is this thing? So this guy is just a symmetric algebra generated by little g. So now this guy is commutative, okay? This is a polynomial algebra. So itself is, so this is the same as, as considering the polynomial algebra on this vector space G star, okay? And we require that so this uh, associate graded module of M is finite generated module over this guy, okay? So we can always find such a nice filtration. So this means that, so this guy, this associate graded module of M is actually a K equivalent coherent sheaf over G star. But moreover, you can show that because, so this filter pieces are K invariant. So actually, um, this sheaf supported, is supported on P star, not just G star. And we can just define a social variety of M to be the support of this uh, associate gradient module. So it turns out that it's independent of the choice of the good filtration. Like this module, this module, the associate gradient module 
itself, of course, of course, depends on the uh, the choice of the filtration, but the its support actually is independent of the choice, and moreover, it is a union of five many many new potent k orbits inside p star, and uh, it's also a Zariski closed a uh, sub variety inside p star. Okay, so in this case, you can see that it has some relation with the k orbits in p star. And in fact, if we restrict this uh, coherence shift to some maximum k orbit in, in, in the associate variety, so well, because everything is uh, k invariant, so we, get, we should get some k, uh, k equivalent vector bundle. The question is what kind of k equivalent vector bundle uh, can we get? So and Schwartz and Vogen show that. Um, so they basically analyze what kind of k equivalent vac bundle we can get, and they get the condition which they call admissible vector bundle over this O sub k, and they should you should think of this vector bundle E as a replacement of the the pre quantum line bundle L in the original orbit method picture. Okay, and this E is roughly a, a square root of the canonical line bundle of O sub K. So, so namely you take the cotangent vector bundle of O sub K. So you take the top exterior power, okay, the line bundle, and then you expect there's a square root of this line bundle. I mean, if it exists, I mean, it doesn't have to ex always exist, but if it does exist, so then this will give us an admissible vector bundle, okay? And then uh, the conjecture of Vogan, a wish list of Vogan is that one can always quantize uh, such a pair so that we get a unitary representation or, or at least a high channel module such that um, the restriction to, of the higher channel module to K representations um, in other words, the K decomposition should coincide with the global section of this vector bundle, E. You see this E is uh, K equivalent vector bundle. So it carries, its global section is a K module. Okay, and then there's also an additional technical condition, which says that if you look at the closure of O sub K, okay, inside P star, okay, uh, so it, it will have some boundary piece. So the boundary piece are also like some smaller neopotent K orbit. So which I denote by this partial O sub K. And we require that uh, the co-dimension of the boundary should be greater or equal to two. So this is a complex co-dimension. Okay, so why do we need this condition? This is because um, so Vogel showed that if we have this condition, then in the associate variety, there's only one unique maximum K orbit. So this ensures this unique maximum K orbit in AV of M, okay? But like in the case of SO2R, so is we have seen before that you have this comb, right? So this is the real picture. Right? So this is the real orbit. So like the principal series of representation, if you take its associate variety, so it will be something which corresponds to this real picture, which is just under the KSV correspondence. So this gives us like, it's like union of two copies of um, two copies of C, and they intersect at the origin. And then you see that so so the boundary piece is just the origin, and it has code, complex co-dimension equal to one. So it's not it's not in the range of this conjecture. And you see that here we have two maximum k orbit, okay. Um, in the associate variety. 
Okay, so the code I mentioned two case is easier because now you only need to consider like one orbit, right? And of course, so this is a, like oversimplification of the conjectures of our organ and other people. So yeah, there's some like more serious version and um, of, um, I think it starts from James Arthur. So he, he is motivated by uh, the Longlands program and the trace formula. And he conjectured that using this new potent orbit to somehow correspond to the so-called unipotent representations. And so there's a lot of progress um, in the uh, in the past, and I think in the uh, uh, when the group is complex, semi-simple, so it's almost settled down. But the real case uh, still there's a lot of uh, so it's still widely open. Okay? So there's. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to mention this, and it's. Uh, it's not a completed list. Sorry about that. So, okay, so let's talk about our approach. So we'll take a geometric approach using deformation quantization, which I will explain later. But for now, let's uh, let's take our O sub K. So this is inside P star, okay? Uh, in particular, inside G star, but it's only K orbit. So we can saturate it, okay? Or we can span it by the, the complex group G so that we get an orbit O, which is the orbit of this complex G. But now for this O, so just like, so it's similar to the real case that we have a holomorphic singularity form, uh, omega KKS, okay, on this O. And Vogan observed that the restriction of omega to O sub K is actually equal to zero. Moreover, O sub K is known to have a dimension, half dimension of O itself. So this means that O sub K is a Lagrangian subvariety of the hom holomorphic singularity guy. Okay. So then, then next what we do is that, so we follow the work of Losev where he deformed the uh, so the function algebra on O, okay, Cordian ring of O to a non-commutative algebra A, okay, using deformation quantization. Okay, so I will explain later um, what that means. Okay, but once we have this A, so then it is it so more or less you get something which. Um, which is like a quotient of enveloping algebra in most cases. So why? Because we have a natural embedding O into G star. So this is usually like in simplicity geometry, they call it a, a moment map. So but equivalently, you can think of it as uh, algebra homomorphism from symmetrical algebra of G into this uh, coordinate ring of O, okay? Just by putting back functions. Um, so, but now we have deformed this, this algebra into a non-commutative guy A, and also for SG, there's naturally a non-commutative counterpart of it, which is UG. So actually you can show that, so this map can also be deformed into a homomorphism between these two non-commutative algebras. So this is called a quantum moment map, okay? So the last step, this is what we, we've done with the work in, uh, uh, in the work with Conan. So we think of, we take this Lagrangian subvariety, this O sub K and the vector bundle over that. So, and take the global section. So you can think of it as a module over C of O. Why? Because, so you can simply restrict functions on O to O sub K. And then you do pointwise multiplication on the sections of E. Okay, so this gives you a module structure. And now, um, so this guy is deformed to A, and we ask whether this guy can be deformed to a module of the non-commutative algebra A, okay? And um, this, and we show that we can, and what we get uh, is a module over A, but now remember that there's a map from Eugene to A. 
So then it, it's automatically a module over UG. Okay, in other words, it, it carries a little G action. Okay. On the other hand, so uh, every step of our constructing is a K equivalent. So the module we get here also carries a capital A K action. And we show that these two actions are compatible. So we get a GK module. So then it's basically like realize um, the higher channel module in uh, Vogan's conjecture. Okay. Although we cannot show that it's uh, unitary, unfortunately. Okay, so let me explain uh, the term uh, the term deformation quantization. So the setup, the general setup is that we given um, X, which is a smooth symplectic manifold or variety or algebraic symplectic manifold with a, a symplectic two form omega. So we can look at its, uh, um, we can take its structure sheaf. So S sub X is the, uh, the sheaf of holomorphic functions or algebraic functions okay, uh, over X. So we then a deformation quantization is just deformation of this sheaf um, into a sheaf which we denote by S sub H bar. So here H bar is a formal parameter. So H bar, so you want to think of it as corresponding to the Planck constant. Okay, so here C of H bar. So this is the um, formal power series ring in the parameter H bar. So the S H bar should be a, a sheaf of flat C H bar address. Okay, such that when we restrict to uh, H bar equal to zero, we recover the original commutative, uh, the sheaf of commutative algebra, S sub X. And moreover, if we take the uh, commutator inside this uh, non-commutative guy, Okay, so the first, I mean, it's usually not equal to zero, but the first order path should be given by the uh, uh, Boisson bracket of the two functions, F and G on my X. Okay, the Boisson bracket is induced by the symplectic structure. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, I think I, I used the, uh, the old Slides. So here, I mean, besides Fedosov, there are also some other, uh, some other people. So this is again not a complete list. Sorry about that. So, so Fedosov showed that so for smooth symplectic manifold, so that so the uh, deformation quantization always exists, and you can classify all of them. Okay, but then in the analytical algebraic case. So this is more subtle. So Ness Segan and Bazukovnikov and Kennedy show that um, the deformation quantization exists if we assume that the natural map from the Durham cohomology of X into the uh, sheaf cohomology of the structure sheaf is subjective when I is equal to one or two. So I the degree, okay. So there's some obstruction in general, like for global reason, but there's also a more uh, serious issue is that, so all this quantization we get here is formal. So it is just formal in H bar because we're talking about the formal power series rent. So then if you take global section of this sheaf, okay, uh, you cannot let, let H bar equal to one. So that will be bad. Okay. So in other words, you don't get an honest quantization in this framework. So, I mean, deformation quantization basically should give you the, uh, the quantum observable in the, uh, in the quantum system. But uh, here there's this issue that it's formal in H bar. So that's not good. Okay, so, but, so here's the remedy. So let's look at the simplest case where V is a symplectic vector space. Okay, um, so in this case, the natural quantization of V is the, the via algebra. So you can construct the via algebra in this way. So you take the tensor uh, algebra generated by V star, uh, then join the formal parameter H bar, and then quotient out by this relation. 
So notice that so here I add a H bar here. Uh, so you get kind of like a homogeneous version of bio algebra. Okay. Uh, but uh, since here we have a formal parameter, you cannot let H bar equal to one. So, okay, so that's not good. So, but we, but then we realize that there's a natural C cross action on V just by scalar pro product, sp scalar multiplication. So this will make this um, entire algebra into a graded algebra. So in other words, so like this, um, for any linear polynomials um, on V, so we require that the, the degree of them under this C cross action is one. And then you require that the H bar has a degree two. Okay, so then you will see that this relation become homogeneous. Okay, so it carries the C cross action. Then we can take the C cross finite part of this algebra. Okay, so this means that we should truncate. So, so we won't, we will not allow uh, formal power series in H bar. So they have to stop at some point. Otherwise, you don't get, don't get C cross finite expression. Okay, so we denote this sub part, the C cross finite part by A sub H bar. So then we can let h bar equal to one, and we re, uh, recover the original uh, the original via algebra. Okay. Okay. So. So uh, fortunately, like in the example we want to consider, so there's always a nice C cross action. Okay, like for the new potent orbit. So you, I mean, so they are sitting inside the vector space G star. Okay, on G star, there's a natural sequence action, okay, the rescaling action. So usually you take square of it, okay? So then on this action, the symplectic form, so it's not invariant on the sequence action. So you rescale by, by weight two, okay? In this case, we say that the symplectic uh, manifold is graded, okay? But of course, two can be replaced by some other like positive uh, degree integral degree, okay? And uh, a deformation quantization in this case is called graded uh, if there's a sequence action on the, this quantized sheaf lifting the one on the original struct sheaf such that H bar has degree two, okay? And let's forget about the even quantization business. So now I can state the, uh, the theorem by Lozov a general theorem saying that if we have a graded symplectic manifold, and moreover, if we have some condition which is, um, which is that the first two uh, shift cohomology of S sub X vanish, vanishes, and you see that, so in this case, such manifold automatically satisfy the condition of Ness Siegen, okay? Get the subjectivity. Okay, then in this case, there's a bijection called the period map between graded quantization um, of the symplectic manifold with the second Dirac cohomology. Okay. Okay, but that solves one issue. Okay, the uh, the issue about the formalness, but it raises another issue. So how can we check this condition? So you did satisfy by our quadrant orbit. Uh, the answer is unfortunately not, even in the simplest case, like the SO2C case, you can take the, the new point orbit of maximum dimension, the principal orbit, and uh, you can show that the first shift cohomology is not equal to zero. In, uh, in fact, it's infinite dimensional. Okay, so that's bad. So this means that we cannot apply philosophical quantization directly, but uh, there is, a remedy, which is that we can take the closure of O. Okay, so this guy is R fine. So the shift cohomology should all vanish, but the issue is that this guy is singular. It's not smooth. But Fedos of quantization only applies to smooth manifold. Okay, but then one can take uh, a resolution of this guy, a smooth resolution called Springer resolution, which is the cotangent bundle of the flag variety of the group. Okay, so this guy is also have a uh, symplectic structure, 
you can quantize this guy. So this guy satisfy the condition I mentioned above, okay? But in general, in general, such um, nice smooth resolution do not always exist. Uh, there's always some like a partial resolution, okay, which is good enough for application of OBI method. Um, so I think due to limit of time, so I think I only have maybe six minutes left. So maybe I just skip this, but I want to say, so lots of show that, so apply this general uh, framework to the question of orbit method. And he showed that for complex and missing from orbit, uh, sorry, complex and missing from group, then those new potent orbits have a nice deformation quantization. You to take the global section and you get a high trend module. Okay. Okay, so now, now it's time to mention our work. So, so we want to generalize uh, this whole thing to the real semi simple case. So now you see that in the real semi simple case, we have to uh, think about this O sub K sitting inside O as a Lagrangian sub variety. So naturally, you should think about quantization of Lagrangian sub varieties. So so let's talk about the general setting for now. So let X to be a, like, as before, like a general symplectic variety, smooth guy, and we fix the quantization of it. So, and assume Y the smooth closed log launching sub variety of X, okay? And also assume there's a vector bundle E, algebraic vector bundle over Y. Then by a quantization of such a pair, so I just mean a module over this a sub h bar, the quantized uh, sheaf algebra, such that when h bar equal to zero, I recover the original E, okay? So what kind of E can be quantized in this way? So this is, so this general question was answered by like Ginsburg, Kaladin, and the co-authors, okay? So, but we want a equivalent version uh, for our application and also C cross uh, equivalent guy, uh, equivalent version. So this is what I, I've done in my work with joint work with uh, Kono Liu. So assume that O sub K and E is the admissible vector bundle uh, in Vogan's conjecture uh, and let SH bar be the uh, even quantization of O. So I didn't explain what is e, what even means, but you just, think about the quantization of O. So I showed that uh, all this quantization um, uh, correspond to second Duran cohomology. So it's not unique, but in the second Duran cohomology, there's a special point, the zero point, and even quantization correspond to that, okay? So then the C cross action, so there's also a C cross action on the vector bundle E and uh, it's unique up to shift, okay? And so then we show that there's a unique K equivalent graded quantization of EH bar. So here by grade, graded quantization, again, I mean that the C cross action on E can lift to EH bar and compatible with all the other C cross action. And moreover, if we take a global section of this quantized sheaf, we take the C cross finite part, just as before, and let h bar equal to one, okay? So this guy, as ex I explained before, so this guy carries a little g action, okay? Coming from the uh, uh, the quantum co-moment map, um, and just say quantized. So A is a quantized uh, version of uh, C of O, okay? And also there's a k, k action on e h bar. So we show that they are compatible. So then we get a uh, GK module. Okay, so everything looks fine up to now, but then there's a, now there's a new serious issue that how can you show that this GK module is non-zero? Like a priori, there's no guarantee because you are taking a global section of a sheaf and uh, bad things can happen. So what we show is that when the co-dimension of the boundary of this orbit is greater or equal than three. 
So then we get something which is, uh, which must be non-trivial. So in fact, we can show this M has a social variety equal to the closure of O sub K. And uh, so this means that M is of the right size. Okay, but notice that in Vogel's conjecture, he assumed that uh, the code definition is greater or equal than two, but we can only show the case for greater or equal than three. So for the code definition two case, so this is my joint work with uh, Ivan Losev. Um, so in this case, actually you have counter example to Vogel's conjecture. So in fact, it's already noticed in Vogel's paper and this discovered by people uh, before Vogel that when GI is nonlinear, so actually some of the admissible back bundles, uh, they cannot be quantized. They don't correspond to any representations. For instance, if we take GR to be the universal cover of SO3R, it's a double cover, and take OR to be the minimal of it. Okay, so in this case, we have four uh, K equivalent admissible vector bundle, but actually only three of them correspond to unitary representation. The other one do not quantize into nice representation. Okay, so for this case, we have to study um, uh, slow doy slices um, along this code that I mean, two singularity, uh, singularity in the boundaries. Um, so this is like, um, I'd say, so basically we show that this E can be quantized to a non-zero high trend module if it's a restriction to this code that I mean, two singularities, um, which is, you have something so-called slow to slice. So basically you have, so here's our O sub K and here's something on the boundary. Okay, so then there's a natural way to take a transversal slice to the boundary and cut the uh, O sub K. So what you get is called a slow to slice. Like in the complex semi-simple case, this slow to slice is also a uh, symplectic variety. And you can also talk about its quantization and how you change the module whatsoever. And we show that, so E can be quantized if and only if it's Sorry, uh, if it's restriction to each code dimension to slow the slice, satisfy Vogel's conjecture. So yet also we only need to check Vogel's conjecture for these code dimension two uh, singularities. Okay. Um, so I think I'm run out of time. So maybe I just end by saying that, so as a partial result of our current ongoing project is that when GI is of classical type BCD, no matter linear or nonlinear, we can show that every irreducible admissible vector bundle are uh, actually quantized to uh, the right higher channel module, such as its social variety is equal to the closure of all some K. Um, and I think I just stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any uh, comments or questions? Yes, I, I have I have one one uh, small comment, okay. which is the following, uh, which is if you want the, the nuance between um, deformations and uh, quantization. If I understand correctly, when you address the deformations, you you don't address the problem of unitarization. So uh, yeah, that, I don't address it here. Yeah. Yes, and uh, so my question is the following. Um, it's, it's, you know, somehow at the conceptual level, it would seem natural that when you deform, I'm not talking of quantizing, uh, when you deform a data which is related to the original group, mm -hmm. uh, you might get something not for the original group, but for a quantum group, which is obtained by doing a similar deformation. Uh -huh. So that's my uh -huh. question. If you want, uh, to me, there is, a, there is an ambiguity when one talks about quantization by deformation between uh -huh. two sides. One side is the Hilbert space side where you want to obtain something which is represented in Hilbert space and which satisfies some unitarity condition. Mm -hmm. And the deformation side, which, okay, is formal, but as, as you have explained, you can make it concrete by taking a finite part and so on. But mm -hmm. then when you, when you are in the deformation side, 
it's very natural not to keep the original group, but to deform the group as well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's my question. Uh, well, yes, when you obtain the Alexandra module, probably the problem doesn't arise there because when one deforms the, the, the group to a quantum group, one does not change the, um, the maximal compact subgroup. One doesn't alter the maximal compact subgroup. So, I mean, for that purpose, it's probably fine. But somehow, in general, if you want, uh, I have this, um, this uh, issue, which I, I would like you to clarify, you know, of this uh, ambiguity between the two notions. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think so what I'm talking about, yeah, thank you for the question, first, first of all. Uh, I think the, so what I'm doing is like, like more naive than, I mean, so I don't have quantum group here. So what I'm doing is, is to me, like a micro deformation or quantization is, uh, is, let me write here. So it's basically the deformation from the, this commutative algebra, the symmetric algebra of G. Yes, yes. To U, U of G. But you were talking about like further deform it to maybe the quantum group or things. So that I'm not, yeah, that's okay. not what I yes. consider here. So I, I'm like in a more naive setting. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any, any other comments or questions? Okay, maybe I have one. So in your work, uh, in the final part of your talk, so where you, where you speak about the graded uh, quantization thing, I believe so. So you, you assume always that there exists uh, uh, a non-trivial maximal compact subgroup, right? Oh, maximal compact, yes. I mean, for semi-simple reductively groups, I mean, you always have yeah. a, like, a lot of choices of maximal compact, I, and I fix one. Okay, you just fix one, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? So if not, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, next week in our seminar, it will be Hao Guo from Texas A&M. And then in two weeks, uh, we will have uh, Stephen Weiss. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.